Hi, I'm Christina Lamb from Medway Fine Printmakers, and I'm here with Nick Morley, um, aka Lino Cut Boy, uh, for Medway Print Festival to talk about relief printing. Um, thanks for joining us, Nick. And um, yeah, let's have, let's have a chat about Lino Cut. <laughs> <laughs> thanks um, for inviting me. Very welcome. So Nick um, does. Um, our, teaches our lino cut classes at Midway Fine Printmakers and um, do you want to little, introduce just what you do um, in general other than that? Um, yeah I describe myself as an artist and illustrator. Um, I studied fine art but what I do now is sort of in between the two so I do I make prints that I sell and exhibit and then I also do commissioned illustrations so I do book covers, um, illustrations for books and magazines. It's mainly books, to be honest, which are a big passion of mine. I dabble in artist books now and then. Um, I run Hello Print Studio in Margate, um, which is part of Resort Studios. And I teach here and there. And um, I've written a book about liner cut as well. So yeah, it's all about the liner cut really. <laughs> so, yeah, I do dabble in other things. And choosing to call yourself Lino Cut Boy, you've got a, a blog as well that you write, so under Lino Cut Boy. Yeah, I haven't written in it for a while. Um, yeah, Lino Cut Boy was my um, online dating name. I don't know if you know that. Um, no, I didn't know that. <laughs> so that's how I met my partner. Fantastic. And, um, so I wanted a a sort of intriguing but non-threatening alter ego name where you have to have a sort of you don't go under your real name this was on the guardian soulmates um website um and then i've i used it for my website and realized that it works really well for google searches and stuff and it just stuck and then i've used it for all my social media accounts and um yeah, now and then in the real world, people call me Lino Cut Boy, but I find that a bit a bit weird. So, <laughs> certainly in in real life. And how did Lino Cut end up becoming your medium of choice? Um, so I studied um, fine art, painting, and printmaking at Sheffield, Sheffield Hallam, and I wanted to be a painter at that point. I wanted to paint naked ladies actually, which is a bit embarrassing, <laughs> a bit embarrassing to admit now. Um, and then um, I really got into etching and I went to Morley College in London for a, a weekend etching course and then I joined East London Printmakers. So I was there about 10 years and then I sort of moved in towards illustration and um, it was sort of a conscious decision to use lino cut for illustration because at that time there wasn't that many people using it um so i sort of tried to develop a recognizable style but with that yeah while still being sort of true to myself um and as a medium i just find it en endlessly challenging and rewarding in sort of equal measure it's it's very simple on the surface of it like the the basics of it are very simple the mechanics of it but um the nuances nuances of it and what you can do with it um are very broad and you know if you if you look up lanaka artists now it's it's sort of um it's yeah i don't know if it's just because it's more accessible through um the internet and social media or if there are more people using it it just seems like there's so many people doing really interesting stuff with it all over the world um and it's got a rich history as well which which i quite like um what's um what do you think it is about the process that it offers that the other processes don't is it something to do with um, how it feels when you're carving or um is it I just all about the end result I think, well, you can talk about printmaking in general, that, that has an appeal, which is definitely to do with the handmade and the excitement of 
peeling back the print and all that and and the physical quality of the print and the ink on the paper um and I think that's had a resurgence as a sort of reaction to digital um, prints and you know digital outputs. Um, but liner cut in particular, I think it's very accessible. It's very easy to get started with it. You don't need a lot of equipment. I'm currently working out of my attic at home because the studio's it's not shut completely, but it's limited access so I've been working up in my attic I'm very lucky I've got this space I can work in it's a bit hot today actually but um you know I'm working with a um a wooden spoon and um you, you know it's fairly affordable it, you don't necessarily need a big press um and the yeah the, the results you can get like I said you can do very graphic, simple stuff. You can do incredibly intricate stuff. You can do very complicated stuff. So there's a sort of puzzle aspect to it. When you get into multiple blocks, there's a, a part of my brain which really enjoys puzzles and putting things together. So working out how you plan, you know, uh, an eight color liner cut in layers and how all the colors interact with each other and stuff. That's what keeps it sort of challenging and fascinating plus you know you can have good days and bad days so I find that with drawing as well you can have a day where you well I find I have a day where I can draw and then other days where I can't draw so Absolutely. I think if I found it easy every time I did it it wouldn't be as rewarding and, and it's when it goes well it feels when you're in the flow of it which doesn't happen that often but that it, it just feels incredible when you're yeah, when you're carving and you're in the groove and um, it's going well, there's, yeah, there's very little other feeling like it. And like I say, it's still exciting when you feel about that first print. I'm sure you still get that. I don't yeah. know any printmakers who don't still feel that. <laughs> I don't know why you would bother if you didn't. No. It's, um, th I do sometimes think about the, um, at what, point the pleasure is in a process when you when you're doing something especially a big project kind of like the is the bit that I'm most enjoying myself um when I've really happy with the concept of it or when I um are in the middle of printing something or is it when I think I'm trying something that is going to stretch myself a bit and then I realize actually it's going to work um yeah. or is it when I've finished I think I think usually it's the bit where I think it's going to work I think that's when I'm happiest but um, sometimes it's not always pleasurable all the way through kind of doing something. It's people imagine that you might be just having so much fun all the time, but actually yeah. the process isn't always pleasure. I think it's to do with um, the unknown quantities. You know, if you were car, I think if it was a hobby and if I was carving stuff just for fun, then it would be pleasurable. But because you've got the, um, the, the pressures of having to produce something that you're either going to be selling or it's, you know, if it's a commission, then it's, it's got to please somebody else and it's got to fit certain criteria and it's got to live up to expectations. That makes it stressful. I think, yeah, I, I always, I describe it as a mixture of pleasure and pain. And I think um, the feeling of achievement when it goes well is, heightened because of the the pain and the struggle that you've been through i mean printmaking is all about making mistakes and learning from your mistakes and developing expanding your knowledge developing your technique and then taking it onto the next print so i'm never satisfied with a 100 percent satisfied with a the print I'm, there's always things that can be improved and there's carving techniques and things that you forget and then you go oh yeah, that's how I do it. So, um, yeah, it's 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 definitely not always pleasurable. I think a lot of people get into it, and they find the carving very relaxing, you know. And it can be, but Until like a slip and you've lost an eye, that's not relaxing. <laughs> um, I'm just thinking about some of the things that um, you choose as subject matters. There's a lot of a lot of um, strange animals appear in your work i just wondered if you wanted to talk about 
what you choose to have as themes yeah um i yeah so uh, usually now my ideas start in in the sketchbook so i use my sketchbooks um just to sort of um just to get things out of, out of my head not even out of my head just sometimes it's just uh, a feeling that that you have it it's, it's a bit like therapy but very rarely do those drawings actually become prints it's um it's maybe more about just getting an idea or a feeling for something um quite often i'll have ideas in the shower or when i'm trying to get to sleep annoyingly um i do i do work in themes I, I yeah i find so I've, in the past i've done series on wrestlers and space tourism and hunters um and the the whole animal thing is is you know i've always had a fascination with nature and um i'm particularly interested in natural history prints now and and the history of that and how that how we've tried to understand the animal world and nature um visually through history and and it's as much about the misunderstandings misunderstandings and the mistakes and um the sort of yeah the gaps in our knowledge as it is to do with um reality and 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 the idea of empathizing with animals i i'm interested in how we project ourselves onto animals and how we give them personalities or imagine them to have personalities and feelings whereas we don't you know apart from maybe certain animals like cats and dogs we don't really know how what it's like to be a tortoise or a bird <laughs> do you know what i mean yeah. <laughs> one of the projects that I want to work on, uh, and it's got no further than that, is is an, a Noah's Ark image. Um, a lot of my ideas seem brilliant when I first have them, and then I gradually convince myself that they're rubbish and they fall by the wayside. Um, but I like the idea of a Noah's Ark. I, I like this, not 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 from a religious perspective, but from a storytelling perspective, I think it's a great story. And I think it's, it's got a lot to do with our times. It, it seems to resonate with me at the moment. Um, and I think just visually, it would be a really nice sort of fun project to, to put lots of either lots of weird animals or lots of really dull animals. <laughs> or, you know, that it won't be a straightforward, it won't be lions and tigers and giraffes. Although, I find that interesting in itself that those would be those are the animals that you imagine or that you've seen on Noah's Ark. But what you know, why would we have a bunch of African animals but not animals of other of other types and from other places? Um, so I would, yeah, I was telling the story to my little boy and we were talking about the fish. You know, what about the fish? I mean. They don't need to be on there because they're in the sea and the birds don't really need to be on there. Quite like the idea of a Noah's Ark just for bacteria and stuff like that. <laughs> what, what that would look like. So yeah, these are some of the ideas that are buzzing around my head when I have time to think about it. So you haven't, you haven't talked yourself out of that one yet? Not yet. No, no. while I'm talking about it, it yeah, it sounds feasible. No, I, I, like, I really like the idea. I think one of the things about um, the print festival and about Open Studios that comes um, next month is by talking to people um, just about your work, the way it comes out of your mouth is different than the way it kind of goes around your head. Absolutely. And um, sometimes it's given me quite quite a swerve on a piece of work that I'm, I've been doing and kind of, yeah, just you have to force yourself to do it really don't you talk to people about your work even though it's not always that easy just because yeah. um, you can you can learn more sometimes um just by yeah hearing it come out of your head <laughs> exactly you you sort of realize 
what you yeah it, you clarify your thought, thoughts in a way and you sort of maybe you you realize that you've made some decisions without without knowing it and um yeah i i do i am missing that because um i'm part of a, a collective of artists and you know you, you work in a similar environment and we're used to that printmakers in particular i think many of us work in that sort of situation where we're daily coming into contact with other printmakers and we can talk about all sorts of things technical issues and ideas and other things um so i'm sort of missing missing that at the moment um so yeah it's, it's nice to talk about it now good you were waving your spoon at us earlier let's um let's have a closer look at that i i like seeing people's well-worn tools so and then my lighting's a bit it's very polished very yeah good. have you had a little but, bit of a, a carve at it as well to kind of change the shape i haven't no it's a hand carved spoon it's double ended i found it in a junk shop in ludlow and um a friend of mine jason evans who's a, a photographer collects spoons he has a big collection of spoons he actually wanted this spoon for his collection but i wouldn't let him have it <laughs> don't blame um, you he, he told me he didn't know what it was but he went and did some research and he said it's a soup tasting spoon so you you stir with one end and then you taste with the small end and then so you're not contaminating the soup but in, for printmaking it's great because this end you get a tiny bit more control over a bit more pressure um but yeah over time it's shiny it's got this lovely patina i'm yeah. a big fan of wood yeah um so yeah i'm doing all my printing with that at the moment i have got a little x cut machine which i can use for up to a4 but there's something about hand printing when you have the time that it, it, it somehow connects you to the image more closely because you're you're going around all the contours of the block and you sort of um, yeah have a physical connection to it that might sound a bit odd if you haven't experienced it but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah sometimes sometimes the machines that make things easier i mean i've got quite an emotional attachment to our etching press because it it's mm -hmm. such a beautiful shape and um it makes a glorious noise as you run things through it and um it doesn't feel like you're handing over the process to something else it's still you still feel very connected to it but mm. um, yeah there is something about um doing things i love diy kind of like sort of low-tech uh, solutions to things yeah uh, so yeah i know what you mean is there any other tools that you're you've got um attachments to for one reason or another or particularly like um i've got some of my rollers here that um this little japanese roller i've had for about 10 years it's starting to get cracked and stuff it's natural rubber um and you get the 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 build up of ink on the the bits that you don't clean very well around the end so it's sort of got this history and this um these traces of all the prints that you've made it's been contaminated because I leave it at the studio, so it gets used for workshops and other people at the studio use it. <laughs> um, uh, and then my carving tools, which are downstairs. Um, again, I'm not, I'm not, I do let other people use them. I'm not super attached to them. But um, yeah, I think I would be very sad if I lost them because again, the, you know, the, the grease from my palm has changed the way the wood looks over the last 15 years or however long I've had them yeah <laughs> no absolutely um thinking about the the print studio actually I've got the same issue kind of like you have to sort of relinquish um your tools you have to let other people play with your toys a little bit kind of um, um and I think that's been good for me actually kind of learning to share my toys and um because when people come to the studio, if they don't feel like they've got sort of free reign, or not entirely free reign, but within health and safety and kind of like um, what's going to be safe for the, for the things they're using and for them, um, 
if they feel more ownership of it and it is just goes for a, a much happier studio if you feel that you you kind of can do what you want to do rather than being too restricted it's really hard to get that balance right um i remember i've worked in studios where the technician has been watching your every move and um it hasn't been relaxing and you've been worried about doing things wrong and breaking stuff and and it is inhibiting so yeah i try and you you have to obviously you don't want anyone to break your um press which is worth thousands of pounds and you don't want anyone to trash all your nice rollers but at the end of the day they're there to be used aren't they and you know I'd, I'd rather they were used and people get so much pleasure out of them um and and generally pe people are very respectful um but yeah I, I think um it's a tricky balance to get exactly right and it's the same with cleanliness, cleanliness and you know there's always every studio I've been in there's always one person who makes a mess and you yeah. <laughs> have to be a bit zen about it otherwise it drives you up the wall yeah <laughs> <laughs> The, yeah, the, the, sometimes you know that um, somebody, when they're on their own in the etching press room, kind of will just fill it with paper and, and like um, ink everywhere and you just like feel glad that nobody else is in at that moment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's when it can be an issue as if, if it impacts on other people. But yeah. Um, yeah, I think as long as they're working safely. I'm lucky that we don't have any acid well. We have we have etching facilities, but they're they're not really used. So I think that's the only time I get really nervous is when people are throwing acid around. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is there any equipment that you're um, coveting uh, at the moment for the studio? Is there anything you really want? I've always wanted an Albion. Um, I, uh, I letterpress is kind of a hobby of mine, which I've been into for. A six or seven years and I've now built up a small collection of type wooden and metal type um, and I have a small proofing press but it doesn't work particularly well so I think having an Albion or I think Colombians probably overkill but um, they're very beautiful to look at um, that's something yeah that's always been on my list other than that, no, I think um, in some ways it's been nice during lockdown just to be reduced to not having lots of stuff around me and just, like I say, I've got, I brought my blocks home, I've got my inks and I've got some paper. I went, it felt a bit, when I brought everything home during, it was like the first week, or it was the day before lockdown, I think, I, I went into the studio incredibly nervous and it felt a bit like what would you rescue if your house was burning down <laughs> but what would I take with me because at that point it felt very apocalyptic and like gosh I maybe I'll never come back here again um it doesn't feel like that now but um I sort of grabbed loads of stuff I didn't need so I've got I've got piles of lino that I had for workshops I was like oh I'm gonna use all these and um but um yeah like i say just having very s simple things um i tend to gather a lot of clutter as well so i'm gradually cluttering up the attic but at the moment <laughs> it's still having a workspace that's free is quite nice i've got i'll give you a little tour so i've got um this is my um drawing system here the classic pegs on a washing line in front of the boiler. Um, I'm very lucky I've got a skylight, so I'm working under that. I had to reinforce the floor or, or put boards down on the floor. So this is the table I'm working at. I've got, um, it's very hot up here today. I've got um, just a bit of perspex that I'm inking up on, uh, a few ink knives and rollers. My wooden spoon and then uh, I don't know if you can see it in the dark I've got um, where are they? a big pile of 
blocks there and sort of um, cardboard tubes. I'm doing quite a lot of sales, weirdly. Um, at the moment, so that's really a godsend because it keeps me busy, but I've got a bit of income coming in as well. So I've had to restock on tubes and mailing envelopes and cellophane bags and things. Um, so yeah, I've got I've got everything I need up here as well as my golf clubs that I've never used and the camping gear that we've never used. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think um, it was cold at the beginning of uh, lockdown as well, so I didn't really want to go to, I could go to Intra, but I didn't, and I did go there just to check on the building, but I didn't um, really want to switch the heating on just for me, so mm. I gathered up a lot of stuff and took it home, and then found increasingly that I just didn't want to go down there when it was empty, and it's a huge surprise to me because um, normally when I am there, lots of people are asking me things, and um, unless it's kind of out of hours, I don't really get a lot of um, quiet time to use. Mm. It's kind of been everything on my own. But I haven't really wanted to use the space. It's quite peculiar. I've really quite enjoyed doing things at home. I think it's start, I'm changing now. I think it's uh, um, now at the point where I want to go back and start using things. Um, but yeah, similar to you, I've got bags of stuff, partly because I've been shooting some like printmaking at home tutorials, but um yeah <laughs> oh and people have been buying my stuff on etsy as well i'm currently i've got um piles of monster stickers <laughs> all over the place so um because um yeah they're magnets actually those ones but um yeah because that's apparently what you need in a pandemic is um is ghouls yeah yeah, but, yeah. i don't know some of my work's quite dark and i i did a my one artistic response to the lockdown was um, a cute little owl and at, uh, at the last minute I decided to put chains on it around its ankles. I'll show you. So, um, oh. it's yes. very bad lighting. Um, oh yeah. It's not immediately obvious but then you spot the the chain and I, I i i wasn't sure how that would go down but i have sold a few yeah i think that people respond in different ways don't they i think uh, black humor is the best kind of humor anyway <laughs> you know. um uh, and, and in the the darkest periods of our history that's that's i found this quite a, a creative time not not necessarily to start with for me, I found it, it, it wasn't feeling creative at all, but it felt like there was a lot going, a lot of other people were producing stuff. It sort of, it sort of went in a way, for, or maybe like that, but at the start of the pandemic, I, I was planning to write a novel and or do all these amazing things. I thought, oh, <laughs> time and space, but having a four year old put paid to that. Um, and then, my creative juices just disappeared anyway, but I'm slowly getting them back. How have you got on with um, technology? Because that's it's not necessarily something that printmakers are brilliant with sort of modern technology. We tend to be a bit archaic, don't we? But we're yeah. having to adapt. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've actually really enjoyed um, having to use Zoom and kind of seeing, seeing how it works. Um, just because people have been forced to so there's there's so much of a higher uptake and kind of desire for people to actually make it work so i think it's an interesting time for that i still run um, a club called wave an art group for for young people who are at higher risk of suicide or self-harm and we've um, we've been meeting on zoom weekly shorter meetings than normal but weekly and for some people it's like a huge um difficulty kind of getting past the anxiety of kind of like people people seeing the stuff that you've got in your house you know or mm. or kind of um just yeah the social awkwardness I mean that's pretty high on on zoom that sort of moment when you go to sign off and <laughs> kind of like nobody knows what to do and like but just yeah. generally kind of um silences and everything feel different 
often when you're in the room with somebody and um, the thing of talking over each other and feeling maybe like you're not being heard or, or stuff like that. It's been quite an interesting thing, just learning the dynamics of that. But actually, I've got quite a technical background in terms of doing web design and um, usability. Yeah, I think you're, you're quite tech savvy. So, um, yeah, maybe not lumping you in with that sort of group but um <laughs> yeah how about the video because i've i've been trying to do some tutorials as well and um uh, the, the best thing i found for uh, i've been doing them on my phone and my little boy's got a toy crane <laughs> which you can move in various directions so i've been using that um with the camera mounted on that um and it's worked really well. I haven't had to spend money on any new equipment. In some ways, it's nice because I'm reaching an, a, a different audience, you know. And there's very little um, um, CO2 output when you do a video tutorial, as opposed to when you've got six people driving or coming on the train to, to come to a workshop. Yeah. It feels a bit more. So, yeah, there's benefits to it, but I haven't. Um, I've been thinking about doing one-to-ones and, and interactive stuff rather than just the YouTube videos. So I I feel like I probably need a second camera for that so I can have one for close-ups and one for further away. Mm. Yeah, I've thought about doing um, uh, workshops where I send out a kit of the things that they need and then we have like... Uh, the, uh, when you're on Zoom for a while, like two hours on Zoom and you're pretty exhausted. So, um, yeah, that's um, something you have to think about, just sort of breaking it down into mm -hmm. maybe sessions that go over a longer period. But that, that can also work to your advantage because people can do their homework. And yeah. Develop an idea a little more and think yeah. of questions they want to ask. So, yeah. I was going to ask you actually about your book because um, I love your book. It's just so clearly written and full of fabulous advice it's very much my favorite book on relief printing um oh, just wondered if that's kind of changed things for you after you've um written that kind of like i don't know anything in like the way that you do things in your process or audience engagement or anything like yeah kind of how what impact did that have for you um i don't know if it's changed the way i work um i, I think i'm always learning stuff and there's things I, i'm planning to do a revised edition because there's stuff that I feel that I could write better or explain better or things that need a bit more space it makes you sound like you know what you're doing doesn't it if you say I've written a book um, and it's a nice tool to use in workshops because there's um, things that I use like there's there's I think eight different artists featured in the book from around the world so I use those to show people during my workshops as examples of different things. It, it's a, it was, a, that, again, that was probably the most painful thing I've ever had to make. <laughs> <laughs> if it wasn't for my little boy being due to be born, um, I wouldn't have finished it. And if he hadn't been two weeks late arriving, I'd definitely <laughs> have finished it. But, um, well, I'm glad you did, because it's, yeah. Um, yeah. I, I find it very useful to show to people when um, they need help in this as well. So, yeah, it's a very good reference point to yeah direct people to. Yeah. I'm going to say thank you very much and um, I'm glad to have included you in the Midway Print Festival, even though we can't do it in person. Well, thank you for having me.